Okay, so we are continuing our series on Genesis 1 to 11, Unfiltered. And today's title is Twinkle, Twinkle, Host of Heaven. <laughs> twinkle, Twinkle, Host of Heaven. This weekend is a um, big autumn festival, and we will go out and look at the heavenly bodies, especially the moon. Uh, with a mooncake and with our friends. And so, looking out into the night sky is, of course, not uh, just a biblical thing, right? But it is a very human thing. And so today, we're going to talk about this very human thing. Now, again, uh, this is Genesis 1 to 11, unfiltered. Unfiltered means that, uh, presupposes that we, when we read our Bibles, we have certain filters on. You know what I'm saying? We have certain filters on. And so the question is, uh, what is the right filter to have? As 21st century people, we have our 21st century filters. We went through um, the Enlightenment. We went through modernism. Uh, we studied in school. We have science. We have um, um, the scientific method, the scientific way of thinking about things. And so when we come to the Bible, the Bible was, is a pre-modern book. In fact, it's an ancient book. They don't have the same presuppositions that we have. Yet, the Word of God was given to them, and the Word of God was, the message of God is encoded in their language and according to their culture. So it would be um, I wouldn't say impossible, but it makes very little sense for God to encode his message in our language and in our frame of reference because he, is, he was given first to these original readers for them to read, meditate, understand, and preserve for future generations. So it is much better than and makes better sense if we are the ones who um, take off our filters, <laughs> right? And look at the world the way they look at it. Which means when we look at, say, this, all right? What, what's in your mind? Twinkle, twinkle, little star. How I wonder what you are up above the sky so high like a diamond in the sky twinkle twinkle little star how i wonder what you are well if you ask me when i look up the sky and i see stars i say they are flaming balls of gas billions of light years away all right that would be what comes immediately to my mind the reason why that comes to my mind is because uh, this is the world that I live in, that I grow up in. I cannot look at it different, you know what I mean? It is just what it is, a flaming ball of gas. The sun is a star, the closest one to us, uh, around which we orbit. And there are other stars like it, other stars smaller than the sun, other stars larger than the sun, other stars that are like so huge that you cannot even imagine uh, how large they are isn't it? And so, when we have that filter on of a 21st century person, and then when we come to the Bible, and we read Genesis chapter 1, verse 14 to 19, and God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning the fourth day. 
right? So immediately, when I read this verse with my filters on, I will be thinking about that on the fourth day of creation, God made all those stars. And then immediately, my way of thinking would be like, wait a minute, these stars came about on day four. On day three, God already made vegetation to grow. Are you saying that plants came earlier than stars and the sun and the moon? Around what did we orbit uh, before then? <laughs> How do we have that day and the night? And some people argue that the day and the night here must refer to 24 hours, right? Because that is what evening and the morning means, 24 hours. But without the sun, how do you get 24 hours? As far as I can tell, the earth orbits around its own axis, uh, right? Facing the sun and facing away the sun, from the sun. And that is how we get the evening and the, the morning, 24 hours. So, Whatever else you may think that Genesis 1 is about, I can assure you, everything I just said, the first readers of the Bible thought nothing of it. The first readers of the Bible wouldn't even understand what I just described to you, which all of you, of course, know. It is almost like drinking mother's milk. It is just so natural to think what a day is, which is the earth spinning around its own axis and then going around the sun, facing the sun, facing away from the sun. But let's look at what the scripture is saying. He said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens. I have discussed with you what the expanse is. The expanse is the word firmament. The word firmament has the word firm in it. Firm means it is solid. To them, there is like a canopy but a firm one right and uh, and, and, and it is like this uh, maybe I've been living in a city setting uh, 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 for way too long with high-rise buildings everywhere um, on Friday I was driving back to Seram, uh, back, back from Seremban after teaching a class on biblical Hebrew and I was driving the highway right and I could see the expanse because I was thinking about what I'm talking about. I looked about it's morning, so it's okay. But then I see, right, the clouds, and I see uh, uh, the sun a little bit shining through, and I see the sky like a dome because it's in the over the horizon. Now we know why that is the case, but to them it must be that the land is flat, otherwise how does it work? And then the sky is... Uh, a dome, <laughs> right? That's, that's, that's the word for it. A, a dome. And I go, oh, that is exactly what they're talking about. And then if the stars, the stars, the sun and the moon, they look as though they are under the dome, right? Because it's a solid dome. So let there be light in the expanse of the heavens, right? Within it, under the dome, to separate the day from the night. Go, huh? to separate the day from the night? Did not God already separate the day from the night in day one by the effulgence of his own glory? He lights up the world, isn't it? So isn't there already the cycle of and the separation of day from the night? Why is there the need for these lights? And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. So we need to have these uh, and so we're coming up to uh, 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 mid-autumn, right? And it is because of the, the moon, isn't it? It's a lunar cycle. Um, and so they are for signs and for seasons, signs for navigation, for days and for years, and let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light, to give light upon the earth. Ah, I understand now. The job of these lights are to be the lights of the world. Right? They are the lights of the world. Their job is to shine in an otherwise dark world. 
Without them, the world will be dark, and with them, they shine light to us. And it was so. And God made two great lights. Didn't say the sun and the moon. There's a Hebrew word, good Hebrew word for the sun, Shemesh. And there's a good Hebrew word for the moon, Yeriach. There's a reason why uh, Shemesh and Yeriach is not mentioned here. Two great lights because, like I said last week, this was a temple. This description of the temple. And the temple, there are those lights. And the same word, Maor, in the light that is in the tabernacle and the temple is used in this to describe what those things are, to give light. The greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. And I emphasize the word to rule. They are rulers. They are kings. Royalty. Huh. And the stars. Kind of like, hmm? What are these stars and the stars? God didn't say he's going to make them. God said he's going to make two great lights, one to rule the day, one to rule the night. And so he made the one that ruled the day. And he did exactly what he said he was going to do. The, one, the big one to rule the day, the smaller one to rule the night. And the stars. Right? So the stars is like some bonus creation, isn't it? You've been tracking, it's like, hmm, something strange about this and the stars, okay? What's going on here? Why do we need them? And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, telling you a second time. That's their job. Their job is to show you the right way. Their job is to enlighten, the, illumine the world. Otherwise, the world will be dark. To rule, again, the world, okay? So, re-emphasizing, their job is to give light and their job is to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. Whatever else you say, what the Israelites thought of the sun, moon, and stars, they thought of them as rulers in heaven. And a few verses down, this is verse 19, right? In verse 26, seven verses down, the Bible says, And God said, Let us make humanity in our image and after our likeness, and let them rule. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over the cattle, and over every living thing, and over everything that creeps, all the creepy crawlers. Right? So human humanity was made to rule the earth. So the heavenly bodies are our counterpart. We rule the earth, they rule the skies. But their job is to show us the way to rule. <laughs> they shine the light to us. And we rule the earth. We are the earth rulers. They are the sky rulers. And then at the end of that poem, that is Genesis 1, unfortunately, the poem ends in chapter 2, verse 3. Okay? Uh, somehow the person who, whose job it was to make chapters, okay, mess it up. <laughs> the chapter should end in chapter 2, verse 3. Uh, so chapter 2, verse 1, first, the heavens and the earth were finished. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then here, first, the heavens and the earth is finished. What is this? Literally, this is called an inclusio. All right? That means it's the header and this is the footer in your, in, in, your, in, your, in your thing, right? A header, a header, and a footer. So this is the end of it. First, the heavens and the earth were finished. And all the host of them, the host, the host of the earth, we know what that is, animals, us, right? And the host of the heavens, there will be the lights above, isn't it? So these two corresponding realm, the realm of the skies and the realm of the, of the, of the land below, they each have their rulers, 
the land below, ruled by humanity made in the image of God, and in the skies, ruled by the lights, by the shining ones. And there are a host. The word host, Sava, means army. God's army below and God's army above. The heavenly army. And you say, no, Stephen, a star, star is just star, all right? That's all there is to it. Stars are just stars. And perhaps you're right. For example, we have um, Psalm 33. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their host. Yeah, that just look like stars. As the host of heaven cannot be numbered, and the sands of the sea cannot be measured, surely sands are not something crazy. Sands are just sand. We can see sand. Okay? So the host of heaven, that is exactly the same kind of a thing, a physical thing, but beware. What is human beings made of? You see? You see what I mean? Okay? And it is exactly about this making. So I will multiply the offspring of David, my servant. So, maybe, okay, fine. Could there just be physical stars that we're talking about? The same thing that we're thinking about is the same thing that they're thinking about? Not a chance. No way. Not with these guys as their neighbors. All right? The superpower in the south, Egypt, the superpower on the north, Babylon, thinks different, think differently. Right? The Babylonian's son is the god Shamash. Shamash. What is the Hebrew word for sun? Shemesh. The Hebrew word for the sun, Shemesh, is borrowed from the Babylonian Shamash. <laughs> from which we get the Malay word semester. The Egyptians call it Ra, the head of the gods. The moon, the Babylonian is Sin, the Egyptian, there's a male version, Khonsu, and the female version, Isis. Jupiter, that's Marduk. Marduk is the king above all gods. And Jupiter is also the king above all gods in Roman religion. Right? Equivalent to Zeus. Horus is the uh, Egyptian uh, Jupiter. And Horus is the, what? The pharaohs are sons of Horus, are reincarnation, uh, incarnation of Horus. Right? So, Horus... Venus, Ishtar, for the Egyptian god of the morning, and they really love Horus. Okay, so Minurta, Nergal, Nabu for Mercury, Sebegu in the Egyptian version. And this Marduk and Ishtar, these Babylonian gods, have then no effect on the Israelites. Esther, Queen Esther, her name is Ishtar. Her uncle's name was Mordecai from Marduk. They have been in Babylon for so long. She, he is, ironically, Mordecai the Jew. Just as I'm Stephen the Chinese. Irony. <laughs> irony of ironies, isn't it? Okay. Mordecai the Jew, and her name is Ish, Ishtar or Esther, but don't tell people. Tell, but you actually have a real name. Her, her. Her ethnic name was Hadassah. But don't tell people that because that's not going to get you very far in society. Okay? If I use my Chinese name, not going to get me very far in society. So adopt more glamorous, okay? Or like that. Okay? okay? Don't let your, you start a business, some more kyongki, lamki, like that, right? Something more, um, you know what I mean? <laughs> okay? Something more fanciful, right? Something more vogue. Marduk. The king above all gods. Ishtar, Venus, that's great. So these are the host of heaven. When the ancient people, they look up the skies, the night sky, they see something very different. And that may not be something that is very surprising to you in the first place. Maybe some of you read horoscopes, right? Uh, right? And uh, some of you maybe have had in the past in the 70s, everything happens in the 70s, right? <laughs> Delved into some of these uh, more spiritual things, so to speak. But this is, is a 
very, very ancient thought. Also not very foreign to many of us who are of ethnic Chinese. Huh? This is Fu Lok Sao. Fu Lok Sao, right? This is Fu blessing, blessedness, right? With the baby, Lok, with the money, uh, wealth, and Sao, longevity. This is Jupiter, that's Usa Major, and the other one, Canopus. These are called Samsung. Three stars, the three stars. Okay, and the three stars are personified into Fuk Lok Sao, no? right? Okay, uh, let's get rid of it. People are going to think what kind of church this is. Huh? Okay, <laughs> right. so uh, there we go. We have, uh, whether you like it or not, that's what the ancients thought when they looked up the night sky, the host of heaven. Israel, certainly not like that. But wait, here is First Kings chapter 22, verse 19. Micaiah the prophet says, Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, he tells King Ahab. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the hosts of heaven, the stars, standing beside him on his right and on his left, like Ting Ting, like that, you know? Okay, like <laughs> the hosts of heaven, and on his right and on his left are these hosts of heaven. If he is the king, what are these? These are his ministers, isn't it? The hosts of heaven are his ministers. That is why Psalm 103, 20 to 21, lays it out open, all right? Uncovers it for us. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will, right? So there's some parallelism here. Bless the Lord, it's parallel by bless the Lord. All you, his angels, is paralleled by all his hosts. Uh, you mighty ones, who, you mighty ones, are his ministers who do his word, who obey the voice of his word, is who do his will. So this is parallelism, right to the right on the dot. Okay, let me try to get back the camera. Yeah. So that's what the hosts of heaven are. When they look up the night sky, they see. Starry, starry, supernatural beings. That is what they saw. Now, don't worship them. Don't worship them. They are not gods. They are creatures of gods. What should they do? Should they receive, accept, worship from human beings? They are the sky rulers. We are the earth rulers. Do we render worship to them? No, they do not accept worship. They render worship. So praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's hallelujah. Hallelujah, right? From the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. He's talking about the heavens. What, what's in the heavens? The angels. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His hosts. What are those? Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all you shining stars. Praise Him, you highest heavens. And you waters above the heavens. Now you know what, that, what all that means, right? The sun, the moon, the stars, the angels, the or the host, their job is to praise the Lord. But why do people worship them? Now, of course, even logically, the sky rulers outranks the earth rulers, isn't it? We are limited here like worms, but we rule, kind of, okay, but we rule the earth. But the sky rulers, they're amazing. In fact, our English language still preserves some of that, that the heavenly bodies, bodies, right? Not just things, but bodies for a reason, because this is a long, right? The, 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 the past superstitions, I suppose, right? reverberates through the ages such that uh, we now call, the language hasn't changed. The concept might have changed. The language hasn't changed. They are heavenly bodies. So the psalmist in Psalm 8, he says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You look at the things down here, how majestic is your name. And then he look up, he says, 
You have set your glory above the heavens and the heaven of heavens. You set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to steal the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, what do I see? Of course, I see the moon and the stars. It's the, it's the night sky which you have set in place. So this is a meditation on nature. So the psalmist was standing outside, huh? There's a Chinese version of it, right? 床前明月光, right? Isn't it? Okay. So, uh, 什么起头起头望明月，低头是不想 like that, right? Okay. So he's like, he looked up the heavens. I look at the heavens. What do I see? I see the moon, the stars, which have set in place. And then, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? I'm so puny. Compared to the sky rulers, you have the sky rulers to make you happy. You have the sky rulers to glorify you. You have the sky rulers to pay attention to. Why would you pay attention to me? Why would you pay attention to humanity? Yet you have made him, although we're so puny, just a little lower than the heavenly beings. Right, the heavenly beings, they are beings. In fact, actually, heavenly beings is a, a gentle translation from, by our ESV translator. Okay, the word there is Elohim, which should be translated as "You have made him a little lower than the gods, than the gods above," because the nations worship those as gods. <laughs> All right, and the Septuagint translators into the Greek just says angels. In what Elohim, heavenly beings, angels. You have made him a little lower than the angels. Hebrews chapter 2, right? You have made him a little lower than the angels. So when he sees the sun, moon, and the stars, no, not the sun, see the moon and the stars, right? In the night sky, he says, you have made us a little lower than the angels. Yet you have crowned him with glory and honor by giving him your image, allowing him to bear your image, here on earth. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. So when he looks at the night nice sky, he sees the stars, he sees everything else, he thinks of Genesis chapter 1. Right? He says, you have put all things under his feet, the feet of humanity, all sheep and oxen, also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. So he remembers the heavenly beings, the lights that are made in day four. The human beings made in day six, the outrankers. But we are in charge here. So, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. We are just a little lower. The difference between us and them is that they are up there, we are down here. But we are both rulers. All right? That is what he's saying. So, you're going to ask, well, that's great. God has got... Uh, earthly family, God also has his heavenly family. Well, why should God have a family? Family? Why not? Why can't he have a fam heavenly family? Just as why should he have an earthly family? So he has an earthly family, right? And he has in his, made it in his image, and he has his heavenly uh, creation. So all of them, their job is to say, bless the Lord, right? All you angels, bless the Lord. But that wasn't the whole story. Where is the drama in that if everyone is just blessing, praising the Lord? There was a rebellious star. Uh, Isaiah 14, verses 12 to 15. God asked Isaiah to raise up a taunt against the king of Babylon. And halfway talking about the king of Babylon, Suddenly, it went cosmic proportion. <laughs> okay, so talking about the king of Babylon, and then suddenly it goes cosmic proportion, and he says, "How are you fallen from heaven? Well, what falls? What falls from heaven? The day star, the day star, probably Venus, I suppose. Which one still still there in the morning in the east? Uh, Venus, sometimes Mercury, um, sometimes Sirius, sun of dawn, right? Morning star. The word day star, morning star, was rendered." into Latin as Lucifer. That is why the word Lucifer is actually a Latin version, Latin name, Latin word for the morning star, for the day star or Venus. 
So you are the most beautiful of the stars, really. Okay, you are a chief star. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low? Why? You said in your heart, "I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God." Huh? Right. So all the other stars, all these other angelic hosts, I am going to preside over the angelic host. I'm going to rise above the angelic host. What does that make me? I will be the king. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly. So you can imagine that it's a mountain, and the king sits on top of the mountain, and all the subjects down here. I will sit there in the far reaches of the zaphon of the of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. What's above the heights of the clouds? That's what's above the rakia. I will burst through the rakia, right, and go up to the heaven of heavens. I will make myself like the most high. All of us are high enough, <laughs> right? We being stars and the heavenly bodies, right, right there. But among all these, the most high, right? The most high God has a meaning. Has a meaning. In order for you to be the most high, right? I remember uh, one competition that I joined. I got first because I was the only competitor, right? So I'm the most high. I'm the world champion of the game I invented that only I play, right? For you to be the most high, there need to be others, <laughs> right? So there's this other Elohim, gods, if you will, and. He is the Most High God. That is why, if you trace all the phrases "Most High God," okay, in the Bible, it will always be in a pagan setting. Always, all right. There is always a pagan element, a nations element among all the nations. There's Marduk over here. There's Ra over this side. There is Baal over on this place, and there's something else over there. There is uh, 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 Jade Emperor over on the far side. All right, gods they may be. The Lord Yahweh, He is the Most High God. But this rebellious star is not happy with his station. He wants to make himself like the Most High. That is exactly what he was. He told Eve, isn't it? In the garden, you will be like God. Don't you want to be like God? I want to be like God. Don't you want to be like me? <laughs> That is what he was saying. But you are brought down to Sheol. You are fallen from the star. Of course, from the ancient days, they have observed comets and uh, uh, meteors, right? And they see whenever a star drops from its place in the sky, right? The, all the stars are supposed to be fixed in their location, and then suddenly. Uh, one of it becomes a shooting star. You must be a fallen star, a fallen angel. And this Lucifer is the first one. Is the most important of that. that is the idea. But then you ask, why is this passage about Lucifer, the original rebel, even here, the rebellious star? After all, the passage begins with, "You will take up this taunt." Against the king of Babylon, why, when you're scolding Babylon, when you're taunting, jeering at Babylon, the king of Babylon, do you talk about the devil? Do you talk about the morning star? Well, because we all know what it is like to reach out. For the stars, isn't it? The will to power, the I'm not happy with my station. I don't want to be just down here. Fly me to the moon, and let me play among the stars. That grasp for what doesn't belong to you. I want to climb higher. I want to be higher. I want to be mightier. I want to be more powerful. I want to be God. You have just identified yourself with Lucifer. You have just identified yourself with that morning star. You say, "Yes, I am just like him." And how else to describe the king of Babylon? 
He's not just interested to rule Babylon. He also wants to rule Assyria. He doesn't just want to rule Assyria. He wants to rule Israel. He wants to finally, ultimately rule Egypt. He doesn't just want to be the king of Babylon. He wants to be the king of the world. The king of the world. The ruler of the world. That's God, not you, but I'll be that. And so, other human kings, for example, Edom. Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. The pride of your heart has deceived you the same thing. What got into Lucifer? He's too beautiful. I'm too beautiful for this. <laughs> I'm too beautiful for this. And so I am meant for more. And so he grasped for the more. The pride of your heart has deceived you. Who say in your heart, who will bring me to the ground? Though you saw aloft like the eagle, though your nest is set among the stars. From there, I will bring you down. You think you're a star? Well, you're going to be a shooting star. I will bring you down to Sheol, declares the Lord. So that is the king of Edom. Another king, back in the book of Judges, invaded a tribe of Israel. God raised a female judge by the name of Deborah. And uh, the king sent his prized general, Sisera. All right? Sisera is there to, to conquer, right? To take lands that don't belong to him, to stretch out, to reach out the pride of his life. And so God defeated Sisera. There was a torrential rain, and then Sisera had his um, uh, chariots. Now, chariots are great unless the, land, unless the ground becomes muddy. And so, when, it, when, the, when the rain came upstream and the flood came downstream, it flooded the plains and all the language of exodus flooding is right there, okay, of the man and his chariots and okay, all of that down there. So the chariots, the chariots got stuck and Sisera ran away and then Sisera is like a serpent slithering his way out of the battlefield only to be crushed in the head by seed of woman, the woman. <laughs> right? You got that story? This is a sticky, sneaky fever, figure, right? I'll talk all about that when we come to the serpent story. <laughs> Not supposed to be talking about stars. Anyhow, that's an earthly battle, a, a battle on earth, right? Uh, you should, if you are a historian or if you are a, 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 how do you say, if you are a patriot, right? A patriot, you win a war. After you win a battle, what do you do? You write a song, right? To commemorate. How would you write it? Would you write it? Hua, like how? Okay, you're know, right, maybe we win the battle, I will plant our flag, we defeated the enemy. Not so with the Israelite songwriter, Deborah. She wrote, the kings came, they fought. They fought the kings of Canaan, at Tanakh, by the waters of Megiddo. They got no spoils of silver. From heaven, the stars fought. From their causes, they fought against Sisera. He says, you think this is just an earthly battle? No, this is a cosmic battle. This is not just Israel versus Sisera. This is the angels of God versus fighting the enemy and the angels of the Lord, the host of heaven, fighting for us against Sisera. Sisera has made himself to be a star. That's why the stars fight back. So, in their view, like earlier in the Micaiah story, what goes on up there affects what happens down here. God shakes the earth, sorry, God shakes the heavens and the foundations of the earth are shaken, right? Or God shakes the earth and the foundations of heaven is shaken. So what goes on up there parallels what goes on down here. There is an intersection between the heavenly realm and the earthly realm that is actually real, and that is the message. So, well, this is all a like fairy tale story. No, but I'm encoded. Do you see the reality? 
there is spiritual reality. And we will just call it maybe whatever language you use to describe the spiritual reality, they use some phenomenological stars as a good way to talk about that spiritual reality. You understand what I mean? The stars is their good way, is their way to talk about that reality. Daniel chapter 8, another king. The God became very great. <laughs> The God became very good. Okay, uh, let me just uh, uh, unpack this a little, uh, interpret it. The God here refers to Alexander the Great. All right, he's the God, <laughs> seriously, all right, of all time. The God became very great, but at the height of its power, the large horn was broken off. Uh, the large horn is Alexander the Great. The God is the. Uh, Greek Empire, and in its place, four prominent horse, horns grew up toward the four winds of heaven because Alexander the Great died abruptly and his empire was split into four, all right, and the four generals. Out of one of them came another horn, which started small, but because he wasn't even supposed to be king, but then he eventually became king, all right. Um, he's talking about Antiochus Epiphanes, the fourth which started small but grew in power to the south and to the east and toward the beautiful land, toward the land of Israel. It grew until it reached the host of heavens. What? <laughs> it grew until it reaches the host of the heavens. And it threw some of the starry hosts down to the earth and trampled on them. Okay, that's worth a lot of uh, meditation, all right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll let you meditate on what this his, what the author is trying to say. It sets itself up to be as great as the commander of the army of the Lord, the commander of the host of the Lord. Do you know what I mean? The commander of the host of heaven. So he wants to equal in rank with the commander of the army of the Lord. And he succeeded. It took away the daily sacrifices from the Lord. That means what, 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 what actually happened historically was Antiochus Epiphanes the fourth he came to Jerusalem and he desecrated the temple. He offered a pig on the temp, on the altar of the Lord and turned it into the temple of Zeus. And he put in temple prostitution and the whole place just became a pagan temple. Took away the daily sacrifices. The daily sacrifice from the Lord. This is what it means for human to be reaching out to be the stars to join the rebellion, to join the rebellion of the stars. And that is Israel's understanding of why the way why the world is the way it is. It is how Israel understands why we were. Our brothers were slaughtered by the Assyrians. The Babylonians came for us. And then now the Persians and then the Greeks and then the Romans, right? And they're fighting each other, killing. It just wouldn't let people to have a... to, to flourish because of these selfish ambitions. And, and that is the basis of all these empires that still exist today. Why are countries at war? Is there not enough food? Russia invades Ukraine over food, nothing of necessity actually to restore the Russian Empire, to be the new Tsar, to be a star. Isn't it? And that is the world we live in. Why do bosses overwork their employees? Is it because they're starving to death? Is it because the children have no food? That's why the bosses starve, that's why the bosses overwork their stuff? Or is it to build the empire? Is it to be the star? And this is the explanation. You want to be gods. This is the explanation for all the things that we see in the world. But we are down here. They are up there. They are more powerful than us. How can we overcome? How can we defeat this evil? How can we, they are supernatural. 
we are natural people, beings. We cannot, so this is the problem, right? This is the problem of the Bible that calls for a solution. So there was a need, a yearning for solution. And one day, here comes the solution. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men came from the east to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and we have come to worship him. All of us in that whole ancient world understood stars the same way and we saw a special star. This star is not any star. This star is a star of the king of the Jews. So Herod got worried because he is the star. <laughs> right? And this is the real star coming to replace him. And so what did he do? He did what stars would do to hold on to power he murders. But the solution to the rebellious star, to this heavenly host, is a greater star, a greater heavenly being. They looked up and saw a star, right? Okay, it's not Christmas yet. But Noel, 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 born is the king of Israel. This is what this is about. That's how the New Testament opened. The New Testament opens with the birth of a star. And the, oh, oh, and the New Testament ends with the affirmation. Revelation 22, almost the last verse of the Bible, almost the last verse of the New Testament. I am the root and the descendant of David, the king of the Jews, right? The David, king of the Jews, what does that mean? That means I am the bright morning star. Because what are stars? Star rulers, rulers, rulers sent from above. That's why you're a star. If you're just a mere ruler on the earth, you're just a mere ruler, but mere of a ruler sent from the skies. This is not accident. It has long been prophesied. Someone else wanted to be a star and sent a false prophet to prophesy against God's people. But he ended up saying, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. Far away, this is going to happen. I see him in a vision from a quite a distant away. Still got thousands of years to go. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter, meaning the king. That's a parallel, right? Parallelism, star, scepter, Jacob, Israel, right? Okay, a star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. Stars are rulers, and one star has been prophesied for Israel, and he has arrived. And how did he defeat the heavenly host. Colossians 2, verse 8 to 18 says, See to it that no one takes you captive according to the elemental spirits of the world. Huh? Elemental spirits of the world? We're talking about something mystical here, something supernatural here. For in Christ, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. He's, he's writing this to the Colossians, and the Colossians, like any pagan town, will be filled with all kinds of stuff that they say it's spiritual and whatnot and whatnot and some other thing, right? See that no one takes you into, because in Christ, the whole fullness, all that is God, dwells bodily in him. Not a little bit to that one, right? Not a little bit to this star, not a little bit to that idol, not a little bit to this God, whatever else you worship in Colossae, but all of God is in Jesus Christ. You have Jesus, you have all of God, you don't look elsewhere. He is, well, all these things, the head of all rule and authority. Maybe you think that Athena has rule and authority over Athens. 
Maybe you think that Aphrodite has dominion over Corinth. Or maybe you think that something else has dominion over that other city. But above all rule and authority, who actually sits on the Mount of Assembly? Who is it that sits on the throne with the host of heaven lined up on his left and on his right? Who is that? Who is the head of all rule and authority? Jesus. Well, the submissive one remains submissive. The rebellious one wants to set up the alternative kingdom. He disarmed the rulers and authorities. He disarmed Zeus. He disarmed Poseidon. He disarmed Athena. He disarmed all of them, Aphrodite. Put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Christ. Let no one, therefore, let no one, coming back to, see that no one takes you by captive to this elemental spirits of the world. Okay, there's an inclusio there. All right, see that no one do that. Here is the reason, because Christ is above all. He has defeated the enemy. So, therefore, let me get back to the topic. Let me tell you what you shouldn't do again. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels. Those are just, at best, angels. Fallen angels, but angels, just messengers of God. So what should we do today? Christ has defeated spiritual evil, but spiritual evil remains with us. It is like D-Day, Normandy, 1944. Was it June the 4th? Can't recall. Where they landed on Normandy. The moment you land in Normandy successful, invade the continent from England, basically it's over. It's over. Right? Hitler and his Nazi army has is no match to Western industrialization. <laughs> and that's the end. But there is still a battle to be fought. There's still a couple more years to go. But the fate is sealed. Or I remember there was one particular World Cup finals, uh, a very embarrassing one for some, uh, the jubilant for others, that by half time it was, what was it? Four new? Five new? Brazil versus Germany? And the streets of Rio were already in riots. <laughs> and the minister of sports had to resign at half time. Well, there's still half the time to play, but the game is over. The match is over. They will still play hard, hard tackles. They even scored a goal. But the match was over. Satan has been defeated. But there's still half time to play. He is now fighting a rear guard action against the forward march of the Church of Christ. It is in this context put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. It's not Nero they were fighting against. It's not some earthly human king of Babylon that we're fighting against. That's just half the story, half the oppression. Behind that, Human evil lies spiritual evil. The stars do control the course of the earth. The ancients were right, but wrong in, in how it did it, <laughs> how they do it. It's not the flesh and blood that we're fighting against. Rather, it is against the rulers. The rulers is not human kings, because the human kings will be flesh and blood against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, against the stars. We are fighting the stars. How can we, as mere mortal rulers of the earth, fight against the rulers of the heaven? Put on the armor of God that has defeated 
the enemy. And the Lord empowers us. In Luke chapter 10, the Lord empowers the 72. I'll talk about 72 another time. It's a, it's a number with chock full of significance. The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, telling Jesus, even the demons are subject to us in your name. How can we defeat spiritual evil? They are more powerful than us. They are stars. How? Jesus says, the reason is this. I saw Satan fall like lightning from earth. I saw him like a meteor crashing down to the earth. He has been defeated. And so, yes, a little lower than the angels, but not for long. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, Hebrews chapter 2 says, of which we are speaking about the world to come. The present world, they are in charge. All right? The world to come is not to them that God has subjected the world to come. It has been testified somewhere where some eight that we have read earlier. What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little while lower. Just a short while lower in this present evil age than the angels. But you have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, in putting everything, it means everything. God accepted, of course. Uh, putting everything in subjection to the human, God left nothing outside of human control. Really? Well, true, at present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to the human, but we see him, the human, who for a little while was made lower than the angels because he left the heavens above to join here on the earth below, namely Jesus, that human, the, the human, and crowned him with glory and honor. Therefore we sing, O hail King Jesus, O hail Emmanuel, King of kings, Lord of lords, bright morning star, and throughout eternity I'll sing your praises. And then here, and I'll reign with you throughout eternity. I'll reign with you throughout eternity because of what Jesus has done. God raised Christ from the dead, from the earth, from the grave, raised from the dead, from the underworld. Think about it, from the underworld, came up and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, star above stars, king, far above all these other stars far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. And you, true, dead in the trespasses of our sins. Who were we following? We are following the stars, following the prince of the power of the air, getting our compass, getting our reading, getting our bearing from the stars. The rebellious ones especially, the prince of the power of the air. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and then raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We have joined the heavenly host. Past tense, seated or in the Greek, aorist tense. But since it's a nominative case, it's past tense, all right? Sit us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. But it is not to angels the Lord has subjected the world to come. If not to angels, to who? To the human, as said in Hebrews chapter 2. And that has implications on how we live today. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? For a little while we are made lower than them, 
But one day, one day they'll be subjected under us and we are to rule over them. So live, behave like that. Why are you still, the context is, why are you still why are you suing each other in court? And going to a Gentile judge? Don't you know that you are to judge the whole world? In fact, don't you know you're going to judge the angels? How are you going to judge the angels? You're going to settle this problem among yourselves in this temporal problem. How are you going to settle eternal problems? In, not to, but that's what it means, right? How are you going to do that if you can't do this? So it is because of that vision and that understanding that Paul had and he wants us to have. And that would really solve, I would believe, 99% of the problems in church and among Christians today. If you know your destiny. So you are a star. You're a star. God's people are stars. Meant to be. Uh, Joseph had another dream. He told to, to his brothers, listen, all of us are stars. I had another dream. This time the sun and moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me, the 12 stars. In Revelation 12, there's a woman. woman. That woman clearly represents God's people, Israel, and she had 12 stars. So Jesus says, remember Genesis chapter 1, we started with, what is the role of the lights? To rule and to shine light into a dark world. They are the lights of the world. But lo and behold, our Lord is the greater star. And if we are in him, you are the lights, the light of the world. What does that mean? How do you rule? This is how you rule. You let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds. You rule by doing good deeds. That's quite the opposite of how the king of Babylon ruled. That's quite the opposite of how the king of Edom ruled. There's Totally the opposite of how the kingdoms of this world is set up. The kingdoms of this world reaches out to be the star, to be the winner, to be the king, to be the one exercising dominion and oppressing, suppressing. But the way to really rule is for Adam and Eve to be gardeners in the garden. You rule by serving. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and gave his life as a ransom for many. He ruled by washing our feet. He ruled by giving himself up for us. And we rule by the same way, the real way to be good stars. So do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault, in a warped and crooked generation. It's a warped, crooked generation. It's a dark world out there. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. Or stars, the word sky here is firmament. The stars in the firmament. <laughs> right? As you hold firmly to the word of life. And at the end of time, Daniel 12, those who are wise will shine like the brightness, the lights of the heavens, the rakia. And those who lead many to righteousness, that's how you rule. You rule by leading people to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Twinkle, twinkle, host of heaven. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time that we have, the luxury of time to consider your word, to mull over your word, such beautiful thing that you have put into this Bible so that we can meditate and study and learn, but also be changed and transformed, be renewed in our mind. Equip us with your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. There is a microphone in front, so if uh, any questions from both this week, yep, I'm sure there are going to be plenty. Um, you have to use the microphone here so that people online uh, can hear. There are 23 participants online. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, of course, when I look up the heavenly, there is no way I think, yeah, that must be some angel up there, right? It's just a flaming ball of gas. There's no way I can think differently, man. All right? Because <laughs> that's, that's the cultural milieu that I'm living in. But I accept, I understand that when the ancient people, they look up at the stars, they see spiritual being and use the language of that and the phenomenology of all of that to describe something actually real. That is otherwise indescribable. The spiritual realm. How are you going to describe spiritual realm with physical words? You use some physical phenomenology to talk about that. So I'll just, I'll just, that is the extent that I can go. So when I look at the stars, I see the stars, okay? But then when I read the Bible, I understand what they're talking about. I've traced the track, the, 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 the storyline of, of stars. Of course, Jesus is not a star, right? But he's the bright morning star. We never, when Jesus says he's the bright morning star, we never take it to mean that he's actually one of those things up there. So likewise, I don't think, I don't take Lucifer as one of the things up there as well, or a comet, or a, or a meteor, right? But uh, I understand the metaphor that, that was being used. Now, for us, it's metaphor for them. Whether they actually believe those things, are, I, I can't tell you. I kind of think they do actually really believe in, in, in all that stuff, so that they write like this. Uh, but uh, the, the word of God, right, is teaching us that the cause of the earth is not just the way it seems. It's not just human interactions. There is spiritual darkness out there that, is, that lies underneath, okay, and orchestrating the affairs of the world. That is why the world is the way that it is. Yeah. Yes. So some people is going to get a starting of stars. Yes. Right. Here we have ice cream. Mm -hmm. It's all stars. Right. And they knew something that they can interpret it or sun. Jesus. That's right. I've been studying the stars for a long time now just to prepare for this message, right? For this session. Um, before this, I didn't know much about stars. But once I start studying something and go on the rabbit trail, my web browser becomes like 150 tabs that I have to, right? You know what I mean? So I, I was studying the stars. So, but then I was studying the stars in order to know the word of God. So it's not the studying of it that matters. It is the purpose of uh, doing it that matters. Growing up, I grew up in a very fundamentalist church. And so I was told, I was interested in psychology, uh, but I was told not to study psychology, right? Because it is darkness in the works of the devil or something or other, right? And so I didn't end up studying psychology. But there's no reason why that cannot be done for the glory of God, right? So it really depends on the purpose of uh, you studying. If you're studying uh, the stars in order to be an astrologer, then that is condemned by the Lord, <laughs> right? So that is not the purpose of that. In fact, um, I'm also following a series on stars because I am trying to understand Revelation chapter 12 that talks about the woman and with the sun and the moon and 12 stars under his feet. And I am now looking at a particular star formation that has the, I think you know which woman I'm talking about, if you know your uh, uh, horoscopes, <laughs> right? And then to see the position of the sun and the moon and, and, the, and, the, and the stars. And it turns out that John was probably talking about a, a, a astronomical, phenomenon, all right, a, a phenomenon of astronomy to talk about the birth of Christ. And uh, to cut the long story short, that star, those 12 stars with that formation and the sun and the moon happened last in September the 11th, 3rd BC. So is that the birth of Christ? I don't know. So that is, <laughs> that is uh, uh, a study of stars, but I'm trying to discern uh, it for the glory of God. Yeah.
Or was it 7 BC? Either 3 or 7. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Nah, nah. I think it's just the, the the best star is the morning star, right? So how do you describe Babylon being the brightest star of the king of Babylon being the greatest king of all the earth, right? Is to compare him to the brightest star, and the brightest star is the morning's morning star. Okay, so you are that morning star. And then Revelation chapter um, 22, Jesus said, I'm the morning star. Yeah, that, that is what's, that's what's going on. It's not about, oh, is it also Satan? And that, that, that is not the intention of the authors at all. Yeah. Okay, any more questions? Otherwise, I think you're very hungry. You're beginning to see stars. Okay, so that's, I've already closed in prayer, so uh, thank you very much. Is there a session next week? I don't think so. Is there one? Uh, there isn't, right? So it's Children's Sunday, so it's the first Sunday of the month. So we will come back uh, the following week uh, in the continuation of this journey that I'm taking you on. <laughs> that, uh, yeah. Okay, so see you in two weeks' time. See you also, uh, people online. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.